here we come everybody welcome 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 uh, this is your nature journal workshop and today um we have a um usually this is our ask jack kind of open forum discussion but not today um you see uh our friend uh jack is about to head off to yellowstone and uh, Grand Tetons and Yellowstone, exploring the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So before you go there, we've got to do a workshop on um, mammals, large mammals of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. There's gonna be a lot there besides large mammals, but I think that this is gonna help. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to, to seeing Jack's uh, observations and sketches and notes um, uh, upon the return. So, um, today is the ungulates, so the hooved mammals of uh, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. We're going to look at the hooved mammals today, and the, the GYE, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, is a great place for looking at this because you're able to see these three different families side by side. So we're going to have um, the, the deer family, the cervidae, the cow family, the bovidae and the pronghorn family, which is the, or is it the artiodactyla, uh, artiodactylidae. Um, so, no, 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 antelocaprides, Antila sorry, um, antelocaprides. So, we're going to get our antelocaprids, we're going to get our bovids, and we're going to get our cervids, and we're going to compare these, and we're all going to draw them. All right. Um, next time we meet on Thursday, it's going to be the carnivores. But let's play with some um, some hooved uh, critters. I'm going to start by jumping over to the thrill cam. So let's draw some hooved mammals. And here we go. Oh, that's the spoiler. Coming soon, your way is going to be a workshop on working with gouache but we're not quite, it's not quite ready for prime time. So here is, I'm gonna uh, block out for you my basic plan for drawing a hooved mammal. And um, the, what I'm going to do is, um, this, this approach, is the system that I use um, for blocking in most mammals these days. And I think you're gonna find that it is, it's, it's a useful shorthand for kind of, you know, I've got that, that system with the, the, the line along the back for drawing the birds. This is sort of, I'll show you what my equivalent is for thinking about mammal shapes. And we're gonna draw an elk and it's gonna be wandering along in this direction. And when I look at the, uh, the, the critter first, the first thing I notice, uh, my first line is just the line along its back. So along the line of its neck and its back. So maybe it's got its head down and it's grazing, all right? So I might have something like that. Um, maybe it has the head up. And they get a line like that. Um, so that, but that sort of looking at the shape of the air behind the neck and the back, that's my first line. So in this case, what I'm going to be doing is drawing a, um, uh, an, an, an elk and it's going to be walking along and I'm, so I'm just getting sort of, it's got a line of its back. There's a little bump where its shoulders are and then a little bit of a scoop where its neck is. So different poses would be a different first line. I do this lightly, loosely. I do this usually with my non-photo blue pencil. My favorite again being the Prismacolor Polar Race. Here I'm doing it with a darker pencil so that it's easier to see on your screen. From there, I hang a head on it. I attach a head to it. And in this, it's really easy to make your neck too long. So just be aware of that. Um, it's very easy to make your, uh, your, your neck too long. So don't turn your critters into giraffes. Knowing that your neck is gonna be, uh, tend to be too long gives you a really good chance of just kind of controlling that. 
And now I'm going to look at the body of the critter. And I'm, for its body, I think of that as a box. So I say to myself, if you've got a back that's about that long, um, how deep down is your body? And essentially what I'm doing is making a rectangle for its body. And uh, the ungulates, the, even, uh, the, the uh, hoof mammals have uh, sort of a very kind of deep, sort of a large body because you've got to digest all sorts of yummy stuff inside of there. And then I am going to get a little bit more sophisticated with this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to attach two keystones. So a keystone in architecture is a shape like this. Um, it is one short side, one long side, and two sides kind of coming in towards that. And that would be the stone that would be at the top of an arch. So these stones would kind of come up here like this. And then you'd get to the keystone, which would be this little wedge. Um, I like to think of the shoulder area and the hips areas as two keystones, one keystone facing up and one keystone facing down. So the keystone facing down is on the hips of the critter. And what I do is, so I'm going to draw my keystone here, kind of a sloping rump. a smaller part forward, and then uh, that backside. So here's my little keystone of the hips. I like to think of the front area here also as a keystone, but this one pointing up. I have the shoulder blade. I go out to um, the, what is that? The um, the uh, shoulder, so the shoulder, top of the shoulder blade here, front of the shoulder in here. And um, then this is going to be larger along the bottom. I'm making this at a little bit of an angle down and back up into here. So it's got a shoulder, smaller place up here, little keystone like that. So I have one keystone that faces up and one keystone that faces down. Um, the body sometimes sags between these. In other critters, it's going to be flat across the top along the belly. Um, it'll also kind of have a little bit of a sag to it. But you're going to find that that often actually has, instead of drawing a curved line, it's often more useful to think of this as a straight line that then tucks up in like that. So sort of when you get to the edge of stuff that's supported by the ribs, there's the body is going to tilt back up like that. So you often get kind of a point down here on the lower side of the body. The front of your neck is going to curve down into this. And on elk, it often has this kind of cool look where, because of their sort of shaggy mane, that it has a little neat point it sort of sticks down like that. And then I'm going to attach my legs to this. For your legs, you want to, before you draw on your legs, take a look at, take a look at the height. If this is the length of the body, how far down below that is the ground, right? Are you a bison where the ground is here? Are you a moose where the ground is way down here? Long legs on a moose wandering around in all that water. Um, or is it somewhere in between that, like on this elk? So I'll put in where the ground is. I will also put in little a little line sort of showing that somewhere in here are my wrists and somewhere here, a little bit higher, are my heels. Now, the leg is going to drop down in two parts. There's going to be an upper part, there's going to be a lower part, and then you're going to get to the foot. Same thing in here, upper part, lower part, foot. When you do these, the closer you get to the ground, the skinnier the leg is going to get. So you're going to go thicker, thinner, thinnest. So thicker, the thickest is up here in the keystone. 
thick, big, massive muscle. Then we are going to go to thinner. And now there's one other point that I want to make. You're going to regularly see this shape with the leg. So here is the rectangle of my body. The front legs are not going to come from the front corner of the rectangle. They're going to be in a little bit, and they are going to be straight posts. The back legs are going to have an angle in them. This joint here is technically where its heel is. This joint here is technically where its wrist is. But the back legs, think of those as a big arrow pointing towards the back. And the front legs are posts. So let's put that in. We're going to go back. That's the thicker part. And then forward. That's a thinner part. And then from there, your hoof is on the ground. So in the front, you are going to have a, from the bottom part of this keystone, you are going to come down thicker and then thin, and then you have your foot. So a um, couple other sort of general details, um, just to kind of round out this outline, a couple of places then just to intentionally refine. You um, on this back leg right in here, it is usually not a sharp arrow pointing in like this. I just sort of initially block it in that way. You'll often see this kind of rounded out nicely. A little bit of a rump on your back end here. On the front of the body, you also will often see kind of down below this sort of shoulder point here, a little bit of the animal's pectoral muscles sticking out here. And what that does is it gives, it just sort of, sort of this little kind of rounds out sort of the front of the box here. So this is my general approach to drawing something. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look across a number of large mammals, and I'm going to see how they differ. Um, so um, there will be different sizes, heads, different sizes, kinds of posture. Um, the lengths of legs will change. And also, you will we'll be noticing today that there'll be some interesting changes in the posture of this back leg. The heavier the animal, the straighter this back leg is going to get. So on a moose, you're going to see this kind of coming down fairly straight. Um, on a light deer, it's going to see more of a bend. On a pronghorn, you're going to see a lot of a bend on the light little, um, light little animal. So that would be what I would draw in first. And then I would come over this and say, all right. Um, you know, here is, here is my, my, critter. This is kind of a neat little thing on the underside of the chin on a lot of these, you're going to see this little business that pops down like this. You see the same sort of a thing on a lion. Gonna make a few little hatch lines here as I come over that lump on the shoulder. That lump is also gonna be something we're gonna be paying a lot of attention to because this lump serves a very interesting function. We'll look at what that is when we get to the bison. Here's the eye. Eyes are going to tend to be round 
from the side. And you'll often see a big kind of duct for a gland in the front of it across a bunch of these critters. If you do get a look at the hooves, you'll see that there's what are called dew claws, these little, um, the, the hoof um, evolved from, um, from more toes, the two center ones being the two parts of the hoof. These two digits have been reduced. And so those are then these little small dew claws that you see back here. Here's where its knee is, all the way up in here. So this whole part up here is the thigh. So this keystone here is, it's all thigh meat right up in there. You'll see just like on your foot, right at where your heel is, there's that little Achilles tendon that comes down. And your critters will look much more lively if they're not, they have more than two legs. Um, so you can just throw that other one in here, either forward, um, you know, make this other one kind of a little bit more backward. And we can just fill those in. So that's my general kind of generic ungulate. Um, I think this one's leg here is looking a little bit skinny. I would want to be in there a little bit more. But this is kind of a useful way for, for blocking, in, um, blocking in a critter. Now, Let's just take a look at a little bit of the variation that we see across critters. So I am going to change my views here. And let's go to uh, screen share. All right, so we're looking at the um, ungulates or the hooved mammals of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And um, here we go. Let's, let's just start with kind of the extreme end of the scale. Right. This is a photograph of the skeleton of a bison. I mean, look at this crazy thing. So this right here is your shoulder blade. That's your shoulder, that's your elbow, your wrist, and that's your fingers fused together and you're walking on your little digits down here. Here's the hip bone, hip, knee, heel. So that joint with that, that sort of sticks up like that, that's the heel off the ground. This whole part is the foot. This is the metatarsals. Um, and uh, and then those are the, the little sort of the finger bones, the toe bones. Uh, so this is walking on its toes, technically walking on its toenails. The hoof is the toenails. But let's look at what's happening with the spine. The spine comes down here, up, whoop, and down. Well, what's really cool about this is that big hump on the back. 
This, it's a very kind of, when you first look at it, a confusing critter because of that giant bump on the back. And um, I'm going to see if I can, whoops, I didn't want to do that. Um, so here, let's, well, but since we're here, <laughs> since we're here, let's just take a look at this. So we look at the bison, there's this big, deep shape with a big bump on the back, right? Notice that the leg, the leg is posting fairly far back. That front leg is fairly far back. And there's a whole bunch of bison in front of that. By the way, which do you think are larger? The hoof prints of the bison's front feet or its back feet? Let's go back to this and see if I can annotate this. Um, so what's going on here? Right out here is this huge bison head, really, really heavy bison head. So if this bison has its neck cantilevered out here, um, it is going to get a really, really, really sore neck. So to help manage that, what it does is it has it has these ligaments in here that support that big neck. So the purpose of this big bump on the back is to hold up this big head. So what you're going to see is on critters with bigger heads, the bigger the bump on the back. So great examples of this are giraffe. Another great example is an elephant. Another great example is the grizzly bear, right? All of these are things, moose, big, heavy head, and bison, big, heavy head. So what you've got here is you've got that. And then we also have, um, let's take a look at this. You have, here's our first keystone. And here is our second keystone. So the front keystone is from the top of the shoulder blade down to the shoulder, to the elbow and up. The back one is along the top of the hip bone down to the knee and across the back. So those are your two keystones. Um, here, the, the back is just making a big line down here. The, this part is going to kind of tuck up. You're going to have heavier legs down here, smaller legs sticking out below that, and then the little feet coming forward. You're going to have heavy legs here and smaller here with the little foot stuck, sticking out the bottom. Right. Um, so one other thing which we would, uh, would kind of add into the, the profile of this is you're often gonna see a big bump in here. That is the pectoral muscles on the front side of the body. And then we have our neck um, is gonna come down to this. So that is what is making this really dramatic, um, clear, clear old drawings, um, really dramatic, Hold on a moment. Shape of our bison friend here. And it's not wanting to change. Now, next slide, please. There we go. All right. So you look at this. And so here's how I would approach it. There we go. And my. Pencil is not really wanting to work. Try this other one. There we are. That's a little bit better. Um, so, um, what I would do is I would first kind of just sort of note that I would do something like that. That is my initial first shape of this. And then I would say to myself, all right, I've got a big ball of a head in here. I usually put in a big ball with a little box sticking down off of it for my head. 
And then what I'm interested in is just sort of the, 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 the box of the body here. So here I've got, I'm trying to make sure I get something that is deep enough to be a bison. And then if I were to put on this, um, There we are. Oops, it's not wanting to draw. You can draw. There we are. You can draw. That's right. Um, hmm. I seem to be having some technical difficulties, but that's, we'll just make do. In the back, I would think of um, this zone as my keystone here. Coming down on the leg, I have a thicker part that then fades into a skinnier part. And the hoof is there. I have a thick part that feeds into a skinnier part here. And notice how in this critter that this leg here is pretty straight. This back one is pretty straight. So that's because this is such a large, heavy critter that these back legs are going to be just a little bit more vertical. If you stack things up on top of each other, it's easier to support weight than if you have a little spring like this. So lighter weight critters can get away with sort of being a little spring loaded thing. Not so much on these. A couple of nice negative shapes here. This angle in the belly and this um, big slope here underneath the, the, the body there. So this sort of a structure is very different than what you get with say a bighorn. So bighorn is also a member of the cow family like the bison, so they're both in the cow family. But look at how much smaller that bump is on top of the shoulder. And we have still have a fairly deep body. So now when we look at this, what is your first, oops, hey, come back. Spoiler alert. Um, so when we're going to be drawing this one, what I start with is basically this line across the back and then note Oh yeah, this one does have a little bit of a hump. That's cool. Here's my ball of the head. And I put a little box out from that. Now I'm gonna look at just sort of how big and deep this body is, right? If it's roughly this wide, how far down do we go? So that way I'm not drawing the big horn like a wiener dog. You're gonna see that the um, sort of the thicknesses of the bodies um, are something that kind of gives you sort of variation across time. On the back leg here, here is this slope that is one side of my keystone here. Um, right here is sort of the keystone of my shoulder blade. And try, try noticing this, look at this. Look at the shape here of this beautiful negative shape between the legs. You see that? That is a very, very useful, useful shape. Um, I will often, um, you know, if I've kind of worked this part and I haven't done my back leg yet, I often, you put in this shape and it's gonna make sure if you get this negative shape correct, it's gonna put your back legs far enough back. Notice again that there is a little bit of chest out here where these pectoral muscles are in front of uh, where the leg comes out. So the legs are not coming out like from the corner of a table here. We're gonna set them in. Front leg is a post down, back leg has that bend in it.
I'm going to clear all of these drawings and just show you um, when you get around to kind of using your pen and doing your kind of final rendering on this, don't do this all over the body and say, look, it's covered with hair. Because it'll just look like it's being attacked by caterpillars. Instead, there's a few key spots where you can suggest the hairiness of them. You've already spotted that thing on the shoulders. So as you're coming over here, I would make just a few little kind of flicks in like this that suggests that you know here's a bump and it's 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 hairy. Instead of putting hair, hair, hair all over the body, I'm going to just suggest that by in a few places showing some of the cracks in the fur. So I will often draw the cracks in the fur rather than the fur itself. On lines like this, where you kind of come around a corner, I will often sometimes just suggest right there is a little bit of hair. So here where we kind of come around the front here, same. Notice, um, Right, you know, here is our sort of front keystone. Look at how nicely the neck just connects down into, into this. That often, kind of getting that, that sort of curve of the neck into your box of the body is a part that is really going to help mold your sketch. And here is a moose, right? This is an albino moose, um, which I picked out because on this wonderful moose, you can see all these details of, of the, the, the body here. This, the shadows show all these, these contours so nicely that it makes for a wonderful study. So I often will do a search online for you know, if I'm drawing a, a lion, I will first do a search for albino lion. If I'm going to draw a moose, I'll do a search for albino moose. And I'll use these sorts of photographs to just help me understand the anatomy and musculature without the distraction of color. So let's take a look at this. How would we start? We would start with, um, we would start with that line in the back. Your body, your body box then hangs down from that. And to make that body box a little bit more sophisticated in the front, you can see, let me clear all these drawings. You can see the top edge of the shoulder blade here. This is then we're kind of coming along the edge of the neck to this point right there where the shoulder is, and then the he the elbow is down here. So this gives me this sort of mass of, of muscles in the front end of the body. So my my if when I'm thinking about most critters, if I were just to make a little doodle over here. I would get something like that. See my two keystones, one pointing this way, one pointing this way, the box in the middle. So there's that one keystone um, on the hips back here. We have that. <laughs> So this is a good opportunity just to point out a few little anatomical subtleties that you can include in your drawing if you want to. 
So you will often see a little ridge right in here, kind of the edge of this shoulder complex where it intersects the neck. There's also a big strap of muscle that goes from the back of the skull up in here, down over the top of the uh, shoulder in here. And so what you can see is that that makes this big um, groove down the side of the neck, this sort of thick mass of muscle that sticks out there. As you're looking at this shoulder complex here, you're seeing muscles in here that run along the side of the shoulder blade. Here you're seeing the bottom edge of the shoulder blade. And this big mass of muscles right up in here is the triceps. So this critter has a shoulder blade in here. It has, that then attaches to a humerus. Uh, that's the upper arm bone that goes like that. And the, between those two, why don't you want to draw? There you go. So there is a big muscle here that attaches into this elbow. And on this end, it attaches up on the other side of this shoulder blade. And so that is the, the sort of very large, powerful walking muscle of the leg. So you're seeing the bulge of that triceps right in there. There's a bunch of tendons and muscles that run down the legs here. So you often in this upper part of the leg can see a few of those little grooves. On the back leg here, this bump here is, and from here, that's where the, the hip bone is sitting. It has a knee that is right in here. So from there, there's a bone that comes down like that. Then another bone that comes down right here to its ankle. And then its foot bone is sticking down here. Right up here is its heel bone. And look at this wonderful tendon that comes down and attaches to that heel bone. Right in here, there is the gastric nemus muscle, a big, your calf muscle that then feeds into um, that tendon here. And so that makes this little tear dropped void back here in the leg. I'm going to get rid of all of my scribblings on top of this and I want everybody to look at that kind of tear dropped shape on the back side of the leg. So you're going to see that not just on moose, you're going to see it on the bison, you're going to see it on the elk, the cow, um, all those sorts of critters, you're going to get that. So that's another nice little detail that you can put in there. So I might put in if I wanted to kind of just suggest a few muscles, I might suggest that you've got the edge of the triceps muscle coming in here. Right. I might put this in. Um, there are also muscles running from the hips down here that often make these little kind of grooves right here in the back edge of the leg. One other fun little groove that you can see is right up here in the front. You're seeing the two pectoral muscles. So this right here and this right here, those are the pecs the chest muscles on this moose. Those are the things that from the side kind of complete the box. Here at the three quarter view, you can actually see there's a little line down the middle of those. Things that make a moose moosey. One is ridiculously large legs. All right, so um, if you get used to drawing other sorts of things, um, these are going to have surprisingly large legs. So it's easy to draw your legs too strong. There's a large bump here because those are going to have to support the fully developed antlers. The other thing that makes moose look moosey is this moose face, particularly out here. So there's, you know, this, this long, long snout that comes down like this. So um, the uh, moose walks into the bar, bartender says, why the long face? Um, the uh, part of that long face is this nose with a flap of skin over it that can close when it puts its head underwater. So its nose is going to kind of come down and there is a sort of teardrop shaped 
nostril, large teardrop shaped nostril on this soft skin that's out here. And that can kind of flop over the mouth. Remember we talked about that kind of little bit of a chin. So you get some of these details into the front end of your moose and it's gonna look moosey. This business here that's sticking down, that's, that's a really cool moose thing. It's called the bell and bull moose will have a bell on their chin. Older ones, you'll actually get these, you know, drips of skin that will kind of just, they can, they can hang down that far. So that's a big area of just tissue that hangs down underneath um, the, uh, the moose's head just because it looks cool. I'm going to clear all these. And lastly, our elk right here. Um, so elk, um, note medium, oops, wasn't it? So it's, yeah, not lastly, <laughs> uh, there's some, some smaller critters. So notice um, with the elk here, actually, let me go back to the moose, and just check something here. Uh, it's not wanting me to, anyway, I'll just carry on from here. So for things that are very elky, one is this, this mane. When you go to draw your elk, the, the mane around its neck gives it this really distinctive, distinctive look. And this one is sort of coming down here like this, and then in here. Um, you will also often see um, very common in the sort of the mane of an elk that it's there's sort of a, a big kind of scoop in here and then it will kind of pick up like this. So it kind of makes this sort of neat just sort of angles and points right here underneath the, uh, the, leg, the neck. So that also makes the elk neck look much thicker because of the long hairs in there in the mane. Other elk details, you have to be sure to include this pale patch on the rump. So um, the um, other name for the elk is the wapiti. So you'll hear some people refer to it as a wapiti. And that's um, the Shawnee Indian term, meaning the ones with the white booty. So ones with the white rump, um, the way you say that in Shawnee is wapiti. So that also is uh, another sort of common term for these. Um, especially in males, you'll get very, very dark legs and, and sort of staining in here underneath them. So have fun with your, once you get this blocked in, uh, the next really important thing to do is just to think about contrast. So think about you know, where are the darks and the lights on it, right? I've got a little bit of light around the eye, but I'm gonna make this sort of upper chest part, that's going to be dark. Um, I'm gonna have dark legs coming down, dark legs coming down, a little bit of darks coming up here beside this, this white rump patch. So if you're doing the three, three, let's try to draw with this, the three value system, you go with one area is your dark, that's here. The next would be your middle values. That would be in here. And the third would be, uh, this isn't wanting to write today. Um, your um, palest values out there over the, the rump. If you're doing stuff with toned paper, this is also fun to kind of punch these sorts of things in. Look at how, look at the angle of this back leg. And now take a look at the angle of, and of this one. So see how there's this much more kind of pronounced sticking out going on back here. 
This is the mule deer. So less of a bump. And notice that the back leg is really sticks out a lot further. So we've got this very pronounced angle going on here in the back leg. As the deer gets smaller, you can build in this spring loaded system. So you're just ready to go zipping around, but you don't have, um, because you're not having to support so much weight with a, with a stacked straight leg. Notice also here that the same sort of features we were seeing before, here's the keystone on the side here, here's the keystone back here. And the same is very true for the pronghorn. Pronghorn, uh, so the, the deer and the elk, those are all in the deer family. Those, that's the cervidae. But the antelicapridae is its own little group. And Jack, as you are first driving up into Grand Teton and you're driving through kind of open sagebrush flats, keep your eyes out the window for these are North American um, antelope. And uh, they're just spectacular critters. But notice overall, not much of a bump. The body is not as thick. And the back leg has this very sort of strong bend in it. So they're not as, as stacked as you would get in, say, the, uh, the moose or the bison. This is a critter that is built for speed. Um, these are incredibly fast mammals. Um, they actually evolved in the presence of an extinct cheetah species. So there used to be cheetah in North America. Um, and these had to, uh, they were trying to not end up on the plate of these. And uh, scientists uh, hypothesize that the crazy excessive speed of the pronghorn may be um, just something that was selected for back when we, this, we had Pleistocene cheetah that would kind of uh, <clears throat> force you to, to be a really good runner. But just notice the, the real proportion differences on this critter. So that is just um, a few kind of anatomical differences. I'm going to jump over to the piece of paper one more time. Um, and hold on a moment. And we'll just sort of we'll just sort of block in block in some beasties. Um, I'm going to block in a bison, an elk. Notice in this workshop, I'm not dealing with the antlers and the horns. Um, there's just so much to kind of uh, pay attention to there. I think that'll have to be a topic for another workshop. Um, but just getting the body shapes and the proportions of these, I think, is is just so very uh, so very helpful. Um, so, um, let me just take a moment and I'm going to, uh, just think again about, um, you're, you're bopping along through the, 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 the sagebrush flats again, and you look out there and you say like, whoa, check that out. You know, who is that? Who's that? Whoa, that is, that's our bison, right? So. Here's my bison. I'm then thinking, yeah, my bison is so big, big, deep body. And there's this wonderful negative shape here in the front that is going to help you push your legs back far enough. So this little negative shape down here, it's going to help you kind of get your bison
So there's that little angle we talked about um, in the belly. And then the back leg of the bison, um, that's going to come down much straighter. The back legs, uh, bison also will kind of have the look as if they skipped leg day at the gym. So the bison will, will, will have this sort of much thinner back legs. The front legs even have this sort of extra shag on them, which just makes them look, look really cool. So um, then if we were to just, uh, here is where its horn is. So antlers are shed, horns grow with you and are never shed. So the bison has horns, the deer have antlers and the pronghorn, interestingly, has an antelicapra horn. And so that is a horn-like um, structure where there's an inner bony, bony core that isn't shed, but there's an outer part that does get shed every year. So I'm then just going to focus on where is where are the lights and darks on my little bison. And I can, you'll see that the upper parts of the bison um, are usually, and it, depending on what part of the season it is, different parts of the upper bison are going to be covered with this sort of shag carpet of, of really thick wool. And that then drops off and is shed through the summer. And so the bison ended, end up looking much more kind of sleek. Um, but you'll see that the kind of the upper parts there were sort of different, different degrees of, uh, to, to which the, 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 the shaggy part has, um, has come off. And maybe what we'll just do is with the same sort of approach and style, I'll just do a one quick elk and we will call it a wrap. So for my elk, I want to think of what is the line along its back. It's got a little bit of a, and it's got a head and then I'm thinking about how deep is, is the body. Not as deep as a bison. And um, then I am kind of blocking in the, the front end here. And we're going to put in the little kind of upper keystone here. And its legs are set back. And then sometimes what I'll do is I'll put in the front leg and then I'll just look at the size of the negative shape here and say that that means that my back leg isn't gonna come down here. I'm gonna look at this negative shape to help me place my back leg and say, all right, somewhere in here, that's where I want this to be coming in. And that helps me not um, not end up with my body being too long. Sometimes I'll put in my front leg and then use the negative shape to place my back leg. Um, 
just you know, one quick thing on um, elk antlers is think of each side as a C. And that C then has a beam attached back to it. And the C part can have these little extra spikes that comes up from it. And the spike part coming back, same thing. So the quick and dirty, a C with a beam. And then you're gonna put spikes coming in from those. And you've got your, um, your, your elk antler. And this is gonna be the same thing where I'm going to just sort of emphasize the lights and the darks. So on this elk, it has dark head. We'll just use the three value system. It's legs are dark and remember the legs they come down thicker and then they come to the thin part males especially will have a dark belly especially during the rut um, they actually also will be kind of urinating on themselves in this area to give themselves that certain odor that just is so appealing so here around the edge of this little white rump that gives our wapiti the name wapiti And I'm just going to have a simplified sort of side antler. We'll get into another day antlers and three dimensional antlers, but uh, um, if I were to add color to this lovely little critter, I would keep it really simple. I have a Brown body. I have dark upper part. And then it is hanging out where the lush grasses are. So it gets chased out of there by the wolves. I think it helps to think of these as groups. I think that um, to, in your brain, relate the deer, the elk, and the moose. In your brain, relate the bison and the bighorn. Um, in your brain, relate the pronghorn with, well, the pronghorn. Um, and um, that also kind of helps you helps you think about these things scientifically and ecologically. Jack, you're going to have a great time there and um, want to uh, just encourage you to feel free to, if, if, if you, you're, you're, my challenge between now and Thursday is to just go online and do um, a search for um, bison, elk, deer, bighorn, just put in the names of some of those critters. And don't worry about a detailed sketch of, you know, the antlers and all the, you know, just let yourself kind of get a, um, go for a bunch of fast sketches of the masses of the bodies. Because um, you're generally going to be seeing the herd of them over there. It's usually not, well, sometimes they're right next to the road. Um, but um, most often you're going to see the herd over there. And so take your time kind of, you know, just playing with some, some, some sketches of the, the whole critter. I would do a bunch of thumbnails. And what that's going to do is just reinforce this in your head. And then you'll be ready for the carnivores on Thursday. 
Um, uh, Jack, is it okay with you if I bring you on uh, the, the, the screen here? Um, so I'm going to add you Spotlight. I hope it is a fantastic trip. Um, I am uh, going to allow you to unmute yourself. Um, if you've got any thoughts, comments, or, or ideas, um, uh, there you go. Um, no, not really, thank, but thank you for the class. Absolutely. I hope you have a really wonderful time out there. Thank you. Um, so let's, uh, now we're going to go to the, the larger group. Um, we've got a few minutes for questions and, um, and uh, comments. I'm going to bring in um, Avea. Hey there. Sorry, hey there, and thank you. Um, this was lovely. I, it's it's just I love when we get to do proportions work like this. What I wanted to do was, I know that not everybody, but a lot of us were at Wild Wonder this past week, so I wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you to everybody who was there, and who made the event so special, um, and all of all of the good conversations that we had um, during during Pencil Miles and Chill during during the after stage backstage pass, just thank you for bearing your hearts to us and for going deeper with us on these things and props for surviving the last seven crazy days. Um, two things, for one, I please, I hope everybody gets a chance to take a nature break sometime soon. I know that after the conference, probably there's a lot of things that piled up while we were, while we were doing that. Um, and the post adrenaline can feel kind of a bit depressing at times, so take time. I hope that you get a nature break and also to reach out to each other because we're still here even if we're not meeting in conference. And an invitation to you, since we don't have lots of time today, maybe write down a moment of wild wonder that was special to you in the chat. And then we can save the chat and look back on it afterwards, just as a thought. And with that, thank you, Jack. Well, and uh, uh, thank you so much. Um, and I really appreciate you um, just calling our attention back to what a wonderful moment of fellowship that was. Um, and also the need to get away from our screens and take some time. Um, I have not done that. I, so your advice is, is advice that I could really, really take. Um, I jumped into busy post Wild Wonder and you're absolutely right. We need to kind of take that time sort of step back and reconnect ourselves with. Um, actually, because you suggested that, I am going to go um, after our workshop here. I'm gonna sit down with my calendar and just book some nature dates for myself. So thank you so much for, for suggesting that. My pleasure. And in that case, I have one more request. Today, I know that probably a lot of people want to share, but let's please try to keep it short so that we can let Jack get out and, and have that break for himself. And let's give him a lot of love right now. I, we, a lot of people put in the work, but you know that Wild Wonder could never have happened without Jack because he is our oh. key. Friend. So let's give him a huge you know, round of applause or as much love as we can. So thank you for that, Jack. Thank you, just, thank you for being the heart of all of this and for encouraging. Oh. Well, thank you. Uh, it was beautiful. Um, all, all these unexpected things happen. The connections with new friends. And, um, uh, Loki, I see you on the line here too. Um, the music that poured through um, from um, uh, Anne, Brady, uh, Ray Bonto, um, and uh, Beth and Fiona. That just all of these, those, those, those beautiful surprises that just reminded me how lucky we are to be in this, in this, in this together. I'm just so happy to be here with you. Um, if anybody would like to share a thought, a comment, or an idea, I want to um, encourage you to use the raise hand function. Um, you can also um, actually raise, raise your hand, um, Heather. Um, I am going to add you in. Hey there. I wanted to share really quick. Um, I was volunteering at the zoo this morning um, and I was so happy after my shift, I was walking past the turtles 
and they had um, the, the little kids sitting down watching them and the um, zoo educator said, now I want you to write in your journals, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, and I'm like, hold the phone. So I, I, you know, not disturbing the class, but I said, are you teaching them the nature journal? And they said, yes. And I said, I said, did you go to the conference? And they said, last week, yes. And um, it made me so happy. And so I talked to the volunteer coordinator and I said, we need to be doing this for our volunteers. And this is so important. And they said, I agree. They said, you know, this is a class we need to have. So that was just this morning and that made me very happy. Boy, you, you, you throw a pebble in those pond, in the pond and those, those ripples are spreading. And um, thank you so much for helping to be an ambassador for, um, for this way of thinking and, and seeing the world. That's fantastic. Thank you. Okay, bye. That was it. Heather, great to see you. And thank you for the volunteer work that you're doing. Um, um, birds fly forever. Um, thank you for being with us. I am going to, um, if you uh, start your video, you can, I can pin you with me. Um, otherwise, um, uh, we'll be able to hear you when you speak. Uh, hello. Hello there. So good to see you. Uh, thank you. I wanted to uh, share one of the pictures I, I draw yesterday. Please, um, please. Let me, uh, I'll, I'll minimize my screen so we can make yours. Oh, look at them. And what an interesting um, angle where we are looking down from above at a three quarter angle and you've got that curved line where the body meets the water really showing that space so thoughtfully. I also see that you are blending your colored pencils together. In that water, I'm seeing hues of greens and blues all mixing together, which um, just gives you so much more that you can do with it. Also, the subtle shadows there on the, especially on that little chick. Um, <laughs> Uh, tell me what was. Uh, tell me about making these observations and uh, and what you saw. Was this from a photograph? Were you exploring outside, or was this from your imagination? Uh, is there it was a uh, from a photograph. I was looking at a duck's picture, and then I saw that, like the water is green because probably of the algae. So I started adding a green tint, and then. And then it had more like an orangish, so you have to add a orangish green to the water. So then it would get a special color that would look a little bit like algae. I'm the way you and that was that with colored pencils that you're doing all that blending. Yeah. See that that is exactly how to get the most out of colored pencils. What some people will do is they'll just kind of go like, "Oh, it's blue, so I'm going to get my blue pencil and put the blue on the on the water." Um, but the minute you start layering those pencils on top of each other, you can build up all these different colors. Brand new car loses roughly. 50. And there are some subtle um, shadows on the baby duckling. Um, how did you create those? So basically, I the shadows in the water are the shadows on the chick. Uh, the ones on the chick. Uh, so basically, I started getting a little black and a little. I got black and then I started mixing it with the yellow so then it doesn't turn black in a way that uh, like it looks like you uh lines like put lines on the duck so it kind of looks like it's shadow so i started mixing the yellow and put a really uh thing a layer of uh yeah i used 80 different types of color pencils <laughs> i oh, didn't use all of them like i used out of the 80 i only used like 10, uh, 15 or something. Um, can you hold up your little set of colored pencils there? 
It's from Walmart. Great. Um, so are, are you uh, based in the United States? Yeah. Right. Um, could I uh, get you to, uh, uh, your, to ask your, um, your parents or guardians if they can send an email to me um, and um, I would like to send you two of my favorite pencils for adding shadows in um, to the drawings that we do. And what it would, if it's okay with them to send me an email with your mailing address and don't, don't say it here um, on, uh, out loud uh, because it's a, a recorded session, but um, send me um, that and I would like to send you two of my, the, my favorite pencils that I use for creating shadows. Like on the yellow duck, I would put in my grayed lavender and then come on top of that with the yellow. They, it, it will, you will love the rich shadows that you can make with uh, the black gray pencil and the grayed lavender pencil. And uh, okay. I would love okay. to kind of support your drawing by getting those two pencils in your hands. Does that sound good? Okay. So I'll uh, ask them. And also, here's my sister. She wanted to also share. Oh, hi there. Hi. Hello. So good to have you with us. <laughs> Thank you. I uh, had searched online for a picture of a squirrel. And so with acrylic paint, I painted this. Oh. What, what you're doing here with the textures is so interesting. The, I, I kind of get those longer hairs in the, the tail, then the body has these shorter hairs on it. Um, and I really feel the contours of this. Um, that is really fun. It looks like uh, with those very pointed ears, red, brown, perhaps the fox squirrel. Um, that is really cool. Um, thank you so much for, for, for sharing this. Is this similar to the squirrel species that you have around your home where you live? Uh, well, I figured out that this was a baby squirrel. I just found it online. It looked a little similar to ours. We like, we live in San Jose uh, and we have like, squirrels all over the place <laughs> they like steal our fruit and stuff <laughs> I, I i have yeah i've got the same problem here i was just uh a, a few minutes ago i was looking out the window and a squirrel walked over to my zucchini plant and came out with two of the flowers um from my zucchini plant and was nibbling was just like i got these treasures and i'm like those are not gonna be zucchini anymore um but uh but that's right that that larger head maybe hold it up one more time yeah, so the proportionally large head is also a baby feature. Um, so the baby squee uh, squirrels, their heads are larger proportionate to the body than, the, uh, than you see on adults. And this really gives you that, that's part of what makes it just feel so cute. And it has like giant eyes and around it, I made sure to add the white to it. So then the eyes really show. And in general around its eyes, it has a white splotch almost. Yeah. And there's a little bit of a hint of light on the uh, eye itself, which also yeah. just kind of makes it kind of look wet and kind of glinting back at you. Looks sparkly. That's right. That's really nice. Yeah, that, that trick for the, the larger head, larger eyes, um, makes anything from squirrels to bunnies and just look, they're, they're just like they're cute, they're baby critters. We call those neonatal characteristics. So a neonate means baby. When so the big head, big eyes, um, the uh, those are our, our neonatal features that um, that just make things look adorable. Yeah, and like the tail. I in general for smaller squirrels, their tails are a lot thinner than the older ones. The older ones have like very bushy tails a lot bushier than tiny ones because they don't really need that much i guess balance because they're supposed to stay in their nest right so i don't think they need as much balance as the older ones which are running all over the place that's a really interesting possibility 
Thank you so much for sharing this. I also um, drew a little peacock next to it. <laughs> oh, look at that train. Those, those, yeah, some of the, having some of those really bright, vivid colors there in that, uh, in the, did you know that the, the long green feathers out there actually are technically not tail feathers on the peacock? Those really? are, up, those are upper tail covert feathers um, that make the big air quotes tail of the peacock. The peacocks have a short little tail, but they've got long upper tail coverts that cover up their tail. And, um, yeah. That's, that's really neat. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm afraid I'm now going to have to bounce. Um, and I would love to see uh, the drawings, notes, and ideas from everybody another time. Um, thank you folks for, for sharing that with us. Um, and um, I just want to, to say again, uh, reiterate what, what Ivea uh, mentioned. Just so grateful to the community that came together uh, in Wild Wonder. We had some really amazing discussions and connections. And I hope that we can continue that and bring that forward. Um, be safe, be well, create art. Let's play in nature. We're not gonna spend our whole time in front of the computer screen. It's a great resource, but the real thing is waiting just outside. Thank you and take care.